Hey guys, you're watching the Best Practices Show. We take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all over the world. And if you're studying high quality restorative, you know there's one topic you cannot ignore. It's called airway. And even some of the best in all of airway have some bad days. And you're not going to want to miss this because I got my good friend, Dr. Jeff Rouse from Spear Education today, who's one of the world experts on airway, talking about some of the challenges on the road ahead. So do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button. We'll see you in a second. Hey guys, thanks for watching the Best Practice Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Crazy grateful for all the feedback, shares, suggestions you're giving us. We're up over 35,000 followers on Facebook. Let me know how that happened, but keep sending us your suggestions. And a good part of it is to the man I've got on today. And actually, Josh called you the Alec Baldwin of, of Saturday Night Live when it comes to this show. And I'm like, well, that's a compliment because you've been on like, I don't know, 15 times, it's awesome. That show, well, now that shows you his age, because I would go with Steve Martin as, Steve. A, <laughs> as a return guest. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And I've had you on many times, but now, Jeff, because we've got a lot of dental students watching and other things, and a lot of people listening on iTunes, tell them who Dr. Jeff Rouse is and tell them where you teach. And you have two practices, right? Uh, yeah, actually, I have... I practice in San Antonio and I actually turned over my, pra my Seattle practice to our associate up there. So I'm just uh, doing San Antonio now as my practice. Right. So I'm a prosthodontist in San Antonio, uh, but I also teach quite a bit out at Spear Education. So I'm one of their resident faculty members at Spear. And um, so those, I share time between those two. And then like I do study club conversations or meetings all the time. So I'm on the road constantly. In fact, I'm, I think you and I probably are the ones that, I, I, it's surprising we haven't been on the same flights together more, more often than, than well, what we have. So. We're usually going to opposite clubs. I, I'm either coming after you yeah. or before you or something like that. And I'll just say this, if you have a study club and you haven't had Jeff Rouse, then you just, you've been sleeping under a rock because not only is he a great educator, but he's also on the cusp of the hottest topics in all of dentistry. And so, Jeff, tell us what's going on. Like, we, before we got on the broadcast, you go, hey, look, even I have bad days. And you just recently had a bad day. And that's one of the things that we're going to uncover today is this hot topic of airway is so important in dentistry, but there's a lot of things that can go wrong, right? Yeah, you know, yes, absolutely. And the reason, it's kind of like forming an interdisciplinary team in doing regular old dentistry. Um, you know, when... I started doing interdisciplinary care probably right when I came out of my residency in 1990. Uh, I worked with a periodontist and we did implant dentistry all the time. So I had to work with that person. And then when I left there, uh, Bill Robbins joined the practice. Bill's been on this, this podcast a lot. And Bill and I developed an idea of how you do global diagnosis or work with other specialties. So we had to learn what the periodontist did, what the orthodontist did, what our oral surgeon did, and what our laboratory did. And you had to develop that team over time. And you would go through periods of time when the lab wasn't on board with how you did things and, or the periodontist was putting implants in places you didn't want. Whatever it happened to be, there were always challenges associated with it. But it was more comfortable for us, I think, in forming those teams because there are other dentists and we're talking dentistry. And now I'm asking people to start forming interdisciplinary teams, um, working with physicians. And now, so the challenges grow pretty dramatically when you're starting to work with a physician because you're not talking our language anymore. You're talking their language. And so, um, you know, sleep physicians or ENTs, we have, to, we have to learn a new language, and we also have to get over this fear we have of talking to physicians. Mm -hmm. um, you know, dentistry has always been bemoaned the fact that we are thought of as not the physicians, not a doctor. You know, you're not a doctor, you're a dentist. Mm -hmm. And so that was always kind of a joke, and, but it was really the re our reality that we don't 
think of ourselves as being a healthcare provider, we're just the dentist. So now to have difficult conversations with physicians is, is hard. And they talk a different language because they talk in the world of science. Um, they read the literature, they know the literature, um, they can quote the literature. And we typically do not have that ability. We are more uh, based on what the latest, coolest thing that came by the office. You know, I saw this scanner. Well, tell me about the science behind it. Oh, but it's really cool. It's got 3D this. And, and I mean, we're, we're more emotional and we're more mechanical than they happen to be. And they're more about asking us, well, prove, prove it to us. If you want me to do that, prove it to us. So it's a difficult conversation for us to have. And, um, and so may, forming this team becomes uh, much more challenging than forming a dental team. Uh, but it's incredibly important because as you already said, airway is where dentistry is going. Um, there's not an, a, you will not go to a large conference where you're doing treatment planning of any kind that the audience can be involved where the audience members don't ask about the airway health of the patient. It, it won't happen. You go to Seattle study club and when they have questions, it always revolves around that. So every speaker knows that question's coming because that's where we're headed with this. Right. Um, so we have to, we've got to build a team. The, Story I was telling you though, is a story about trying to help out a kid and a two year journey in trying to help out this kid. And probably the reason the story became uh, important to me today was actually I, from one of the people I mentor, I got a, a text earlier complaining about a physician that had placed a patient of hers on CPAP when they were 13. Two years later now, at 15, the child still has problems and yet the physician had stopped the intervention uh, orthodontically on the particular patient. So she was lamenting the fact that her team wasn't uh, harmonious and in sync with one another. And I said, well, here's my story. So that's where we started was, uh, today was sort of a, a, a two year mark of a story of a patient that went bad. And I wanted to kind of tell it because everyone that does this is going to face these challenges and everyone is going to have these days. Even the guy that goes out and teaches it about it every single week has these types of days. And so I guess, uh, you know, people hearing that it doesn't always go well, even in my office, it uh, may bring some uh, either, either pleasure to them or, or, right. uh, <laughs> or, Maybe it just makes makes everyone realize that it uh, it's going to require a lot more effort. That it just doesn't come that easy, and no matter where you're living and, and who you are. So. Right, right. And you mentioned I asked you the quarterback philosophy in interdisciplinary treatment planning. Sometimes people you like to use the quarterback. You you use the word lead. Explain like you said, someone's got to lead. Explain that. What does that yeah. mean? I mean, it, it, it's quarterback, leader, whatever it happens to be. But somebody has to come come up with a plan. And that plan has to have somebody monitor the plan. And um, so I've been doing, as a prosthodontist, that's very, I'm very comfortable with that. I've always been comfortable with it. Putting together, here's the overall treatment plan, here are all the members involved, here's the timing of what we're gonna do so that we can not only be very efficient at getting through the therapy, but the therapy ends up getting us to where we wanna be. So we get quality and efficiency in the treatment planning. Too many times if you do multidisciplinary care where everyone's kind of doing their own thing, you don't get predictability of the final outcome, which is fairly obvious when the implant comes back in the wrong location. But more importantly, I think you don't get efficiency of care because mm -hmm. there are times like say during orthodontic therapy, you can take advantage of that and do some bone grafting or place some implants. And so that everything culminates at this same moment in time. Ortho comes off, implants are ready to go, and now the props can be done immediately. Right. Um, too many times there's this lag that should, didn't really need to occur. Now I'm, I'm really comfortable doing, with, doing that, and I think most dentists are good at, at that kind of thing, putting together and making somebody being a, be a leader in the group. Um, once again, now we have to evolve that. Now somebody has to lead the physicians and get them on board as well. And that's, that's tough because 
They do not speak our language. Most of them do not know what we're doing and why we're doing it. And so there's a lot of education that has to go into it. Right. You and I have been to the Seattle Study Club Symposium many times together. And one of the re recurring themes we see, we probably see this slide three or four times, almost every time we go is while there may be many different treatment plans, there's only one true diagnosis. And I don't know who said that, but it's brilliant. How much of that is going on in airway? Like, Everyone's trying to treat, but like the diagnosis is still the major issue. Agree? Yeah, yeah I agree. Um, and, and I'll go one step beyond that. Um, more to Amsterdam, more to Amsterdam okay. from Penn was probably the one that, that coined that phrase. But um, um, in the diagnosis in, in airway, it, I mean, it could be you have apnea. That could be a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, but I really think we've got to go beyond that because you know, people talk about phenotyping things, you know, what, finding what the real problem is. Um, I think we need to actually figure out how the patient reacts to strategies. In other words, there are going to be patients that all you need to do is give them a decongestant and they're going to be better. Mm -hmm. And there are other patients where you need to do maximum mandibular advancement, but they may look exactly the same they may have exactly the same apnea index. It's just that one is more reactive to change than others. And so I, I do have a problem when I, I, Facebook seems to be the major educational source for airway right now. Oh, of course, right? So, uh, I do have a problem when I go on certain sites and I see you post a picture of a patient and immediately the, the treatments start coming out. It's like, well, you need to do this, you need to do that. Well. How do you know? All you're doing is correcting to some anatomic norm and then hoping the patient gets better. Well, should you do something to figure out how the patient's going to react to give you a clue as to what therapies may be required? Mm -hmm. it, they may need to go well beyond anatomic norms to fix their problem. You may need to do orthognathic surgery. You may need to do some bigger surgical intervention. Um, and so that's where we came up with the Seattle protocol is to say with the patient, you can call them an apneic patient, that's fine, but, and you can put them on CPAP, but that's not, that's not a good answer for the long-term health of the patient. It's just not, we're finding out that CPAP isn't the magic bullet that we thought it was in the past. It's, it's not as effective and not as efficient as what we really thought. And it really is a lot, I mean, when you look at it, what, are we intended to live that way? And the answer is no, we're not. No. But in order to figure out what the right strategy is for the patient to fix themselves, we need to see how the patient's reacting to our, our treatments. Right. And if they're highly reactive, we may not need to do as much as if they are not reactive, if they have a lot of issues associated with that. Right. We may need to choose orthognathic surgery, even though it seems rather aggressive right. because and the patient needs it. Yeah, and you helped me this with this a long time ago. Sometimes in CPAP, when you talk about reacting, see how the patient, you're teaching the body to react to the pressure. And you, you mentioned like neurologically things get rewired. So the patient's actually learning to live on the pressure and the pressure yeah. goes away. Again, learn it, yeah, learn, learn it to live with a crutch. Right. And, and that crutch, you know, do we, I, I, it, it's most damaging in my opinion with, the, with CPAP. But I think learning to live with an oral appliance, a sleep appliance, is, a, is once again a crutch. And mm -hmm. so why don't we get rid of the crutch? Now, patients may not choose to get rid of the crutch, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we ought to at least offer them that alternative of getting rid of the crutch. Right. I also believe that children shouldn't stay with a crutch. I don't think we ought, if you're putting a child on CPAP and that's going to be your solution. I think that's ridiculous. Right. Cause the bone's got to develop, right? Yeah. If you say, I'm going to give you CPAP for a, you know, a few months to get you healthier and get past some of these issues. I'm all, I'm, I'm good with that. But to say, you know, here's your CPAP, pat them on the head and send them away as if that is, you know, you've somehow fixed them. You've just, you know, that, that's not, to me, the right long-term solution for any patient that we have, much less for a child, which kind of leads us to the, to the patient that I was telling you about, because I saw him when he was um, nine, almost 10 years old, and now he's coming up on 12. 
And that's where he is today. And that's what was so upsetting about the stories that I was hearing today and what, um, and how even somebody like myself that I think of myself as being the leader and can direct physicians and direct strategies that it gets lost. These patients get lost and they get going the wrong direction, in my opinion. Um, and stuff happens when you start do, working with people that are used to multidisciplinary care and not interdisciplinary, and that's physicians. Mm -hmm. Physicians are used to doing what they do and not caring about anybody else or any other plan. I'm going to do what I do and, and I'm going to be in control of this. And some, somebody that has a bigger vision of the patient needs to be in control of it. And I would suggest to you dentists and many dentists have that vision. Yeah. And this happens to you. I mean, what do you do when this happens? You just take a deep breath and you fight the fights that you can fight. I mean, what, um, what do you do? Yeah. It depends on the battle. Um, I, I always call myself an advocate for kids, but sometimes um, you just have to let the parent make a mistake in my, a, a mistake in my opinion, you know, um, you have to let them go and do what they, you know, what the physician, physician suggested. And then just keep checking back. And so that's what we did. We just kept checking back every so often. And sure enough, it, in this case, it kept going the way that I thought it would go. And so now I'm earning more and more of the trust of the patient back and away from the physician. And now I have the ability to get the therapy I think is going to be more appropriate for this particular patient. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now I could be wrong, but jot it down if I am. <laughs> we'll put I'm, a not, I'm not. <laughs> You're, You're not. <laughs> You're gonna take <laughs> stamp this one. <laughs> yeah, I always put wrong. dates next to things. Because <laughs> I can go back to them now. And I want to go into the kids thing because obviously you're passionate about this. This is really what drove your whole career, you know, as you learned about more of this in your journey with your son, who I saw hit a bunch of home runs last week, which is so cool. Um, but the kids thing is. That's a moving target. Now, you mentioned this before. Now, we can't even use sleep studies as, you know, they're advising against that when it comes to ad noises, correct? I mean. Um, yeah, it's, well, it's not so much that they're advising against it yet. Okay. Um, okay, so you're, the way you said the sentence was, we can't even use sleep studies. I would say it differently. Um, we've depended too much on sleep studies. Mm. Um, I can't tell you how many times I sent a kid out to get a sleep study done when I was first getting into this because I thought that would be the appropriate protocol. Find a kid, send him to a physician, let the physician do a sleep study, and then we could get some treatment done for the kid. Well, time and time again, the kid came back without having any level of apnea, and then no treatment was rendered to that child. At best, they got some Flonase. That was it. Mm. And the answer was, well, they don't have apnea, so we're not going to do anything. Well, that's wrong. And we've known it's wrong forever. Um, it's just no one would bother to actually like admit it. I mean, if you, if you kind of hold them off in a, in a corner, you could get people, physicians to go, yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, but they should have been treating and from the signs and symptoms of the kid all along. The s sleep study, if you were, in fact, there was a, there's a recent, sort of a, uh, an editorial about the fact that sleep studies on kids are not as good as we thought they were. And they said that about 90% of the kids now, luckily, are not being sent through a sleep study before they get their tonsils and adenoids removed. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. They're doing it based on signs and symptoms. So that's a really good sign that that's coming. But there's still physicians out there and apparently all the people I teach work with the 10% that say I have to have a sleep study mm -hmm. and what the studies, what the data is now showing is of the kids that should get their tonsils and adenoids out, only half of them that go through a sleep study are going to show enough of a problem to warrant it. So half of the kids going through sleep studies that should be treated are not going to be treated. And I, ha I ran into that all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I still fight that battle and it kills me because my guys around here are 
uh, a lot of them are military trained and there, you know, there was a rule in the military before you take out tonsil and adenoids, by God, you have to have a sleep study done. Well, sleep studies were free if you were, you know, in the military, in a military family. And so they didn't have to spend $2,000 on a sleep study sometimes or $1,000 on a sleep study. And the other part is that, you know, it just led people astray. It, and so a lot of kids weren't getting treated that should have been treated. So I'm glad that we're actually getting away from using that as a standard and instead having the physician watch and listen. And in fact, level two in the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines are for studying kids is, you know, do a sleep study. That's our gold standard. But right below that is a video of the, of the child. So parents are just videotape the kid struggling to breathe at night or wandering around the bed or grinding their teeth or they wet the bed, whatever it happens to be. Those, those are incredibly valuable in getting therapy done. So you don't have to, you need physicians that are aware of that and aware that signs and symptoms mean more than some number that you get from the sleep study. Yeah. And I'm going to be the young dentist here that you're going to mentor and say, Jeff, look, I get this, but I can't even get physicians to call me back or how do I even start? Because I have a hard enough creating an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary group. Like where would you start and what, what would you tell a young dentist? So, I mean, it, they're getting, you're, you need help. So I hope that they're in study club, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Seattle study club, Spear study club, I hope they are just some local study club that they have together. I hope that they have a community of dentists that they're, they're studying with and growing with, because I think that's the best way for them to do it. And Absolutely. it also is the best way to learn this airway information and to form a list. So every time I leave a study club, I ask them to, I say, okay, here are all the people you need. You need a sleep lab that does kids. You need a sleep lab that does adults. Maybe the same lab, maybe two different labs. You need a sleep physician that does adults and one that does kids. You need an ENT, but you don't need one ENT. You need an ENT that does kids. You need an ENT that does balloon sinoplasties, functional rhinoplasties, that does U triple P surgeries in the back of the throat. You need, you know, you need an orthodontist, but you don't need one orthodontist. You need an orthodontist that will intervene on a four-year-old, that will intervene on a, you know, a do bone-borne expansion, which we'll talk about in a minute, instead of just tooth-borne expansion, that'll do surgical types of orthodontics. So you, you make a list of all those people, and in your study club, you start writing out names, because somebody in that study club has gone through a sleep study. Mm -hmm. Somebody's kid's gone through one. So you'll now have all those names. It, whether, you know, good names, bad names, whatever it has, you're going to have names. Somebody's kid's had their tonsils and adenoids taken out. And so you just start writing down a list. So you now have a study club list of all the names that you can begin with. And then what I would really love to see, which is the easiest way for this to happen, is the study club gets a case that has airway, an airway component to it, which is any wear case. Just find a wear case. Uh, or if, if you see a bunch of kids in the study club, take pictures of a bunch of kids. Everyone brings a picture of a kid, whatever it is. And then they invite the group of physicians in to actually go over cases. Hey guys, we're seeing things that are pointing us to airway. Let's, are you interested in being part of our team? Mm -hmm. So study clubs takes the pressure off the one-on-one -on -one meetings that have to happen so often uh, with physicians that we're not comfortable with. And, and, and honestly, a lot of physicians um, think of us more like a drug rep trying to get to them rather than a colleague and so it's hard but if you say it as a study club hey we're we're having a study club we're studying this particular area of interest of yours then i think you'll find that you can have more success that way and it takes your, the pressure off of you as an individual person to make that connection yeah that is fantastic advice because that's those resources are hugely valuable for the rest of your career and they're right at your fingertips yeah. so yeah, absolutely. And, and when you, there's a, there's a group up in Virginia that they've formed uh, now that they've gone through that step one of finding the people. Now they're refining the group. And now that they've refined the group, they've, they've um, uh, created a, uh, a referral cycle that occurs within the group. So the dentists are getting 
a significant number of referrals from physicians and vice versa uh, for this type of treatment, which is, I mean, if you happen to have a practice that you like doing orthodontic, you know, treatment on kids, you know, expansion, and all that kind of thing. Well, I mean, there's a, a ready source of revenue that could come from the physician's office for you. Um, if you like doing adults with wear and com complex restorative, now just teach the physician why that patient's an airway patient and you'll get them in your practice. So it, it, it absolutely works. But you got to form the team and the team is hard to do on your own. It can be done. I did it. I did it twice. I did it here. I did it in Seattle. Um, people do it. It's just easier as a group, really, right. honestly. It just so much less pressure. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. And, now, and there's not, it doesn't have to be competition, right? Right. I mean, group. I mean, you're not, you know, granted they may send more cases to one or the other. I mean, but uh, so long, it, it, it doesn't have to feel like, you know, like you're competing against the other people in your group because everybody needs those, those, you know, physicians to help them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I, I know I only get you for a little bit longer, but let's talk about the bone. You were talking about the bone expansion piece or the bone. You mentioned it and you said we're going to go into it a little bit later. Can you shed some light on that? Yeah, actually, let me tell you the story. Of, let me tell you today the story of the child. I'm going to give you the Cliff's Notes version, and then I'll get to why we were talking about bone bone expansion. Um, the story is I saw a kid two years ago in my practice that was um, just about to turn 10 years old. And his parents came in saying, we don't, um, the teachers keep telling us that he has attention deficit and hyperactive disorder, and we don't think so, but he may. Uh, we'd love to keep him off medication if at all possible. And we know, because her sister is actually a dentist and, refer, and had seen my lecture, we know there may be a connection between his you know, dental issues and this ADHD and what do you think? So I did an exam. He's, um, he's transversely very narrow. He's more of a vertical grower. He did have his adenoids removed, but his tonsils were left, which is a mistake in my opinion during the surgery. I think you should always remove both uh, of them. That's what uh, some of the more famous pediatric uh, pulmonologists and sleep physicians are now suggesting that it shouldn't be a you know, one, one or the other, it always should be both. Mm -hmm. uh, because like this child, the tonsils are still obstructing his airway. Um, he had, was tongue-tied, so he's, the narrowness could be from the fact that he could never get his, the tongue to the roof of his mouth, and he's a mouth breather. Wets the bed, grinds his teeth, never sleeps through the night, doesn't wake up refreshed, wakes up with headaches. So very, in my opinion, a very classic airway patient. Now, because he had already gone through a surgical procedure, which is removing the adenoids. So he's gone through anesthesia, had his adenoids removed. My thought was we needed to expand him first and take care of the tongue tie, do the things that dentistry can do in order to make this child better. And if at the end of doing dentistry, um, he wasn't completely better, then we could always fall back on having another surgical procedure. Yeah. So I referred him to the orthodontist and the orthodontist, because he was in a mixed dentition at the time, said, we're going to put him on a main growth maintenance program, which is exactly the wrong thing to do. Um, the, ortho, the world of orthodontics, in, once again, in my opinion, has to change. Orthodontics, orthodontists have been taught that we don't start seeing kids until seven years old. That's too late. That you it didn't matter when you expand it, you just, you can wait for a growth spurt to expand. And if you look at all the literature, it says that when tonsils and adenoids are removed and when the airway is improved, there are growth spurts. So if you go in and expand somebody that's having an airway problem, they're gonna grow because they now start sleeping. So make the growth spurt happen. But more importantly, by expanding them and increasing nasal volume, you're gonna give them the ability to stop mouth breathing and become a nasal breather. And when we do that neurocognitively and systemically, the patient is gonna be healthier. So I don't care about the teeth anymore, I care about the patient. And so you need to expand when you need to expand, which is right now. So I was upset at that and had to start battling with the orthodontist, but unfortunately in the meantime, we get a sleep study done. Sleep physician um, said he has apnea and I called a 
orthodontist and said, the patient has apnea. The orthodontist said, well, of course I'll expand him now. And I said, you missed your chance because the parents are not going to let you do that now. They're going to get his tonsils taken out. So now the kid, because the physician said, go get surgery done because the physician doesn't recognize the transverse discrepancy and simply knows that tonsils are still left there. He sent a kid through another surgery. Mm -hmm. I couldn't talk the family out of it. And they said, we'll expand if he ends up with apnea in the end of doing this, which I knew he would be because he's too narrow and he's still tongue tied. So they do the surgery, takes out the tonsils. He still does read as a sleep study. He still has apnea. The parents are now back and say, okay, let's do the expansion and do the tongue tie. Well, in the interim, the physician at, gets that second sleep study and brings them back in just recently to go over the second sleep study and says, he still has apnea. And they said, yeah, we know that. What we're going to do is we're going to get his tongue tie released. We're going to get myofunctional therapy done. And we're going to do this expansion. The type of expansion that we're talking about doing these days is with temporary anchorage devices in the palate and pushing off the palate rather than using the teeth because you get more nasal cavity volume growth that way, which is what we're really after in the long haul. Mm -hmm. So the physician said to them, I don't want you doing that. I don't want you to change him physically uh, before we know that he's going to not, you know, that he's going to be able to breathe better. So we're going to put him on CPAP. Well, if you think about it, wherever CPAP pushes on the face is going to be retractive in nature and it's pushing in every spot that you need to actually grow. So if you look at the data on kids that are on CPAP, they end up being maxillary retrusive and that's exactly the problem this kid already has. He's already way too back, far back and his, his nasal cavity volume hasn't grown at all. And so it, the physician is telling him, we're going to do the opposite of what you need. Now, I love for kids to breathe, and I'm okay with CPAP for kids where it's kind of an emergency and we need to get by, but this is pushing us the wrong direction. The second thing the physician said is don't do born bone, bone born expansion. I, you know, essentially I forbid it type of thing. Well, the, see, the bone born expansion he was talking about is actually a SARPI where you have to reflect all the tissue back, you split the palate, you split up high, and then you expand the patient. He's talking about what we do on adults that have severe apnea, not what we do on kids at all where we put four tads in the palate and push off of them. So now mm -hmm. the parents go away thinking that CPAP and not doing expansion the way I suggest it's appropriate based on a physician recommendation on things that he really doesn't know a whole lot about. So even the person that talks about this all the time still has times when everything goes wrong, completely wrong on, on these types of cases. So uh, you ask me, what do you do? And what you have to do, in my opinion, is you just have to keep chugging along. So I've got letters going out. I've got data. I've got, I'm sending research to the physician saying, this is why we're doing what we're doing. And in the end, it's, it's more about the parent. And so I have to go back and explain to the parent why a physician is actually wrong, which is a hard discussion to have. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to keep the kid on CPAP, but it's working against us the whole time. Mm -hmm. And so the physician has to be on board to get rid of that. But everything else is going to be dentistry. And in the end of the day, I don't have to ask the physician's permission to do dentistry on any of my patients. Mm -hmm. I can do dentistry. That's why the protocol was developed the way that it is, so that it's just doing dentistry on patients that we needed to do anyway. Physically changing them, it's ridiculous. They don't recognize that the kid needs to be physically changed in order to be healthy, in order to have teeth in the right location and a bite the way that it's supposed to be. Yeah, but it's so much to consider, man. And that's why, you know, when you lose, you can't lose the lesson. There's a lot to learn. And I, I, I have a good feeling that this, this topic is not going away for many, many years. And I know we, we got to let you run because you got patients, you got patients coming in from all over the country now seeing you because you're the man. Now, hey, before we go, I want you to, to mention you have a big course. It's probably already sold out, but you actually do a course on airway prosthodontics. It's the first week in May. The last one was oversold by 30. I don't know if there's any spots available. Just tell us what airway prosthodontics is. Airway prosthodontics is my way of differentiating what we're doing from sleep dentistry. Sleep dentistry is looking at making an orthotic for a patient and move their lower jaw forward. 
And airway prosthodontics is actually looking at the impact that a dysfunctional airway has on the entire stomatonathic system and what we can do in order to do dentistry that may make the airway better in, as a bonus for us. So we're not focusing on making the apnea go away, we're focusing on normalizing anatomy and then letting the body actually heal itself if it, if it can, if it chooses to heal itself and making decisions based on the dentistry we've wanted to do for these kids anyway. Just like this young kid that needed you know, bilateral crossbite, he needs transverse and AP expansion. That's dentistry. The bonus is I'm going to get the kid to breathe better because I can grow nasal cavity volume. And if I do it right, I can really maximize the benefits of it. So that's what airway process is, is. And then learning the protocol that we were talking about, how to get the patients to show you the therapy that they actually want. So yeah, the first week in May, we're going to do that out at Spear, Spear Education in Scottsdale. And so people that want to know more about it can go to spereducation.com. Yeah, and we'll post a link. Uh, if you're watching this on Facebook, we'll post a link directly to the course. You can just click on it. And if you're listening on iTunes, you just can find it at spereducation.com. Look up Rouse, R-O-U-S-E, and you'll find them uh, out there. Buddy, I am always grateful for all the time you give us. We got tons more of subjects to cover over the next couple of months. Um, so I know I got to let you go. But uh, thank you guys for watching. Do me a favor. If you found this valuable, just hit the share button. Share it with your colleagues. It's an incredible topic. And we'd love to get it out there. And until we see you next time, keep watching the best practice show. You guys have a great rest of your day.